All right. Good news, Scott. Uh, Water race travel has availability in November, the week of Thanksgiving, which is kind of a rarity. Wow. That is good news. Let's go. I would love to go. You want to go spend Thanksgiving together? <laughs> are you going? Where Where is this place that Waterways has? Um, Tavarua. Oh, my. Tavarua. Perhaps the most uh, sought after desired location in all of surfing. I think that's a that's a first of all that's a great question. What is the most desired location in all of surfing? And I think Tavarua is definitely in the top three. If you broaden it out a little bit, you could say Hawaii as a general location. Yeah. But in terms of an actual resort that you would stay at, Tavarua has got to be it. Yeah. Um, but what ends up happening is. Um, Families tend to book these for the holidays and then just do that every year. And so these are generally booked up from November through December through New Year's even. Um, but I'm not sure if there was a cancellation or what the circumstance is, but they do have availability for the week of Thanksgiving and then some through December as well. So if you want to get in on that, uh, I talked to Brian at Waterways and he said it's a great time to go actually because it's not getting full bombarded by swells, but it tends to have some of the leftovers uh, from the Southern Ocean kind of season. So you get lots of good, but not huge waves, like six to 10 feet. And the other great thing about November is the winds are typically, um, you know, lighter. So you kind of get all day set, all day opportunities to surf rather than just the morning. Well, there you go, folks. Take your family to, how many how many spots do they have? Let's see. I don't think he told me actually. Oh, so okay. I'm not exactly sure. But you can inquire directly through waterwaystravel.com and then they'll let you know and they'll go quick. So check that out if you are interested. And then well, if you're going there, go ahead. Well, for the record, I want to go. I yeah. want to go. I Reach out. I want to go. Like, I seriously want to go. Uh, whether I can go or not is another question, but get on it. Waterways Travel, Tabarua. And when you're there, bring your NVS fins. You can stock up on your NVS fins while you're at the boardroom show, but then bring them with you. Yeah, I know. I I just, uh, Ryan Sakel's making me a Twins, and he's like, which fins do you want? I go, I think I want the Stu Kenson ones. Those are the ones I've been running. Let's just start there as a base point. They're great fins. The Twins are set by Stu Kenson, Naked Vikings fins, and we'll, we'll take it from there. But um, I'm pretty excited about a new board with some new – NVS fans. I saw um, Jamin from NVS doing a live stream with Ron from Board Porn. And uh, I think it was Ryan Harris, maybe from Earth uh -huh. Tech uh, uh -huh. last week, too. So out there sharing the knowledge and um, communicating with, you know, connecting with the audience. But you can see him at the boardroom show and ask anything that you want to know uh, in about two weeks. So go to or go to surfnvs.com, of course, for everything. Yeah. As we see some movement at the takeoff zone, it's Kelly Slater grabbing rail. A clean entry, this thing holding open, it spits. Uh, when it spit me, I thought it was going to spit me off my board. Comes out with the spit, spits him out. Comes out after the spit. Gets spat out of another good looking wave here. Spit, spit, spit. We're just spitballing, right? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, guy. Yeah, guy. Can you heck yes, David. It is a yeah, guy type of morning. It's October 2nd, a Wednesday. And this is Spit. We talk all things surf and some other stuff occasionally. And uh, good morning to you, David Lee Scales. Good morning, Scott Bass. Excited to be two weeks out from the boardroom. How are you feeling? Yeah, feeling pretty good. Two weeks out from the boardroom. Um, actually, a little less than that. Um, like 10 days. I think by the time listeners hear this, it'll be a week. October yeah. 12th and 13th, the Boardroom International Surfboard Show presented by U.S. Blanks. Uh, this year, honoring icon of foam, Bob McTavish. We also have the Best in Show Twinser category presented by Go Fast Campers. Live music, three great bands are going to play um, some really good music. And um, Boardroom Talks, we've got Brian Dickerson from Wavepool Magazine. He's going to sit down with Zeke Jacob Kelly and Tom Lochtefeld from Wave Lock and discuss the latest and greatest in wave pools. And uh, Scott Hewlett from the Surfers Journal is going to be um, is going to have a Q and A, a discussion with Brad Malekian 
about all things, mostly probably about his book. But with those two talking, who knows which way this conversation is going to go. And Scott's book, Flow Violento, a Scott Hewlett omnibus. Didn't you do a Surf Splendor podcast with him? Yeah, I did. How did that go? Is that good? So good. Yeah. I mean, we didn't really dive into the stories in the book. We were more just talked story and got his backstory, origin story, all that sort of stuff. But um, so the book is not revealed through our conversation, but it was really good. Cool. Well, so look, all of that and much more, uh, of course, great deals on boards, wetsuits, gear, Colby Plus will be there. Well, there's probably five wetsuit companies that are going to be offering great deals on wetsuits as we head into the winter season here in Southern California. And of course, I usually leave with at least two boards under my arm. And I know for a fact I have two boards already lined up. So <laughs> could be three boards. Um that, that's yeah. important to know. Come if you're interested, if you're in the market for a surfboard, hold off for about 10 days and come to the boardroom show and make a decision there. Uh, because it, it's the greatest collection of boards that were like all everybody pulls out all the stops, of course, when they're building out their booth to exhibit their boards. So yeah. that's where you're going to get really cool, unique stuff. Yeah, for sure. So it's it's just a ton of fun and it's going to be a good time. And I know that uh, we're all looking forward to it. Presented by U.S. Blanks, the Boardroom International Surfboard Show, October 12th and 13th. Del Mar Fairgrounds, too. Yeah. Really cool. Uh, I'm looking Fun forward nice. to it. Fun surfing at the river mouth. I mean, people don't realize this, but it's right next. It's right across the street from the Del Mar River mouth. Yeah. So uh, good, yeah. good surfing there. It's fun. Got people that I know flying in from around the country to come to this thing. So yeah, we good. got people coming from all over, man. Yeah. Israel, France, Puerto Rico, S South Korea to shape South Korea. Only yeah. mackerel, to Mexico, shape. Spain. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Yeah, it's well, going to be great. I got a question for you following up last week's conversation. Yes. Who won the Abu Dhabi Classic? It's the uh, Stephen Sawyer. Good. Very good. That's 50% of the answer. Who won the other, the women's division? Do you not know? <laughs> uh Alice Lamon. Oh, do yeah. You, do you know who Alice Lamon is? Uh, I watched a couple of her waves. Oh, you she's, did? She's a great surfer, obviously. I mean, she's the world champ or she's the winner of the Abu Dhabi. I guess it's not the world champ yet, but um, I saw her surf. Yeah, it was, it was good. Did you, you know watch some of this? I did not watch a single wave surfed. Oh, that's too bad because it's hard to discuss it. <laughs> Not that uh, we want to, but I do have one thought. Well, yeah, no, it's perfect. We can discuss it. I mean, my discussion point is that I was not enticed to watch it, um, but I'm curious what your one thought is. My one thought is I think that the level of surfing, longboard surfing can be, I, okay, let me boil it down to this. I think the best longboard surfing in the world occurs when somebody takes a longboard, does a nice drawn out bottom turn walks up to the nose and hangs 10 for a good solid period of time and then turns flips hang he hangs heels and then walks back uh, maybe does a drop knee cut back runs up hangs 10 again throws one foot out into the wave face just like just does incredible footwork and what i saw uh and i didn't by the way see the finals but i saw some of the semis i didn't see, all i saw was cheater fives and yeah. I know for a fact that like the Marshall brothers, Joel Tudor, uh, there's a number of guys, Harrison Roach. I mean, there's actually quite a few guys like, you know, that I'm not even touching on all of them that can ride for lack of a better phrase, a tail dragger longboard and get up there and just perch 10 on the nose. And that's sort of where the, that's the ultimate. And from there we go to hanging heels and all those other things I described. And if you look at the best longboarding in the world, perhaps David Nueva in 1966 or something right along those lines, you're going to see this guy hanging 10 and soul arching and it's incredible and it's difficult to do. And I think that wave is difficult to nose, right? I think it's, but I know that there's guys that can do it and yeah. I didn't really see that. And that's disappointing because to me, that's the ultimate nose in uh, longboarding. 
so it's, I mean, I know because I've talked to some of those longboarders who you just mentioned that they're not interested in going and competing. Yeah. Uh, certainly not on the WSL's kind of uh, platform. And so is, do you think it's a reflection of that? Andy Neblis is not interested in going to Abu Dhabi to compete at the WSL's event. And so you get other surfers and for whatever, re like you would imagine Stevie Stoyer can do what you're talking about. So why wouldn't I don't know. Not with a leash on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hard. Great point. So that's pretty, a great point. Pretty too. hard to walk around on a board. Well, I mean, I can't, you know, really talk about why Andy doesn't want to surf in it, but I do think that, change is probably best going to come from within i don't think sitting on the sidelines um you know i don't know it's up to them i, I don't really i don't really have any you know i don't have any i don't have a horse in the race so to speak i don't really care but what i'm telling you is that what i saw isn't like the best longboarding in the world it was great surfing don't get me wrong these guys are great surfers i'm not here to throw shade on steven sawyer or um, Taylor Jensen, those guys absolutely rip. And no, of course, my hats are off to them and to the gals. But what I'm saying is, in my opinion, that's not the epitome of longboard riding. Well, I'm glad I stood by my decision to not watch a single wave. Then <laughs> I feel vindicated in my decision. So often, you know, we cri I criticize the WSL events, the shortboard events, and then I just am like, why am I even watching this stuff? And so I kind of took a stance with this event. I'm like. Abu Dhabi, not interested, wave pool, not interested, longboarding, not interested, you know, so I just decided not, not to watch. And, uh, wow. sounds like I made the right this decision. Is, this sounds like the first moment in the slow pivot towards you creating a wine and food podcast. <laughs> it could be. You've completely out on the surfing part. Well, it'd be funny if my whole surf experience was related to contest surfing, then yes, that would be the pivot, but very little of my surf experience has to do with yeah. watching contest surfing, you know? Yeah. Um, for the record, Alice Lamonia mm -hmm. is she's French. She has two world longboard championship titles. Oh, so did not, did not know that. No, so neither my, did my I. Apologies. What, which is funny that we don't know that. I mean, it relates to what we're talking about, but congratulations to her on this win. And then Stevie Sawyer won on a self-shaped board, which is important to note. And I have, in fact, seen Stevie at the boardroom show a number of times. So he's yeah, a big fan. I, I, I'm super stoked. Somebody sent me something, or both of us, something about that self-shaped board. And I was like, wow, this is one of those self-shaped world champions that mm -hmm. we talk about. And then somebody chimed in and said, well, he's not the world champion yet. There's one more event, I guess, or something. But that would be cool to note. I'm I'm actually a huge fan of that, obviously, a self-shaped um, world champion. I think that's cool. And when was the last self-shaped world champion? Do you remember? Yeah. Uh, Mark okay. Richards? I think it was Mark Richards. Yeah. yeah. So unless, I, unless we go to, there was probably a longboarder, uh, you well, know. We had this conversation actually. Yeah, it was we did. Kai Salas. That's right, Kai Salas. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Was he in this event? Yes, he was in this event. So well, great to see that. And yeah. uh, I've been tracking Stevie for a few years, and his boards are rad. He's making really cool boards, and he surfs really well on um, a wide variety of boards, from smaller twin fins to short boards to mid pointy, kind of mid sized pointy single fins. All the way up, of course, to winning events on a longboard. So really talented dude, super interesting, yes. doing great work. Yeah. And again, I'm not here to throw shade on Steve. I'm stoked for him and I'm stoked he's building boards and all the competitors, you know, they surfed great. Again, I just want to reiterate, they they were surfing wonderfully. And it's just, uh, you know, in my my own sort yeah. of, uh, yeah, I think I explained it. I, explain I get it. I yeah. get it. We all get it. Everybody, yeah. everybody listening gets it. That's why I think we're discussing it. Because who said that? The same challenge. Are you ready for this? Who said I'm that? Ready. I've got it. Who said that for you? I think I'm going to stump you this time. I want to be surprised. Okay. I started out hanging with Bill Caster and Skip Fry, surfing La Jolla and Bird Rock and Pacific Beach. I was surfing. I was surfing up the coast a bit too. Swamis mostly. I'd surf there day in, day out. But the Swami Surf Club would never nominate me. I wasn't clean cut enough. I had a Mexican girlfriend. I drove kind of a low rider. I smoked some grass. Meanwhile, the win and see thing started rolling. 
and the Macamita Destruction Company was starting to rumble. The Win and Sea Crew had this wild reputation. They were the heaviest street fighters, the hardest drinkers, and had the wildest chicks. There were guys whose entire wardrobe were SS uniforms. I decided to start a surf club at Win and Sea since the Swami's crew wouldn't have any of us. Chuck Hasley and I got together with Thor Svensson and built the Win and Sea Surf Club from the ground up. We owned La Jolla. Who said that, David? Was it one, Mike Diffenderfer? Was it two, Mike Hinson? Was it three, Raymond Patterson? Or was it four, Butch Van Artsdalen? Butch Van Artsdalen. <laughs> Wrong. Dang it. Yeah. <laughs> Mike Hinson. That's Mike Hinson. Oh, that makes Michael sense. Michael Hinson, too. the legendary Michael Hinson. Uh, quite a character. And just the quote itself was almost borderline. Uh, you know, it, it, I wasn't even sure if the show might get canceled for me even bringing up this quote. No, not at all. I, it's history. Um, before you gave me the multiple choice, I had Butch Van Artsdalen in my head. So I just stuck with it once you finally mentioned it. Yeah. He's, he was a founding member too, probably. Right. I imagine he was. Yeah. 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 Um, but man, what a time to be alive. I, I would imagine. I remember going to La Jolla for a family vacation when I was pretty young and I was first into surfing and we were staying at a hotel and the guy at the hotel, like the concierge or whatever, even mentioned like, Hey, don't go surfing over here or over there because it's known for being localized. You know, like you really got to watch your P's and Q's. <laughs> Surfers are the worst, man. I know Surfers he probably was worst. just protecting himself, but it has that reputation is the point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it had what you're talking about uh, permeated the community and people knew to be wary. Yeah. yeah. So, so you got Mike Henson in the gold, California oh, gold surf auction. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. There's a Mike Henson rainbow Malaya gun. It's around eight feet long, and it's just a gorgeous, sleek, down railer rainbow surfboard. It's from 1970, and it's got the cool little carved out area up in the nose to put lead weights in, which is what they did back then. Mike would carve out a little zone where you put lead weights in the nose to get you down the wave face on Maui during those really strong offshore winds there at the Malaya Harbor. So it's, and it's never been waxed. The sport's brand new, dude. It's such a cool board. And um, it's one of the many boards on offer at the California Gold Surf Auction. And the uh, bidding begins on Saturday, October 5th. That's this Saturday. And the lots will begin closing in earnest Saturday, October 19th at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. You can bid from anywhere in the world. Download the auction app, California Gold Surf Auction. I've seen Henson at the boardroom show as well. Oh, yeah. Henson. Henson will be there. Maybe oh, every show. year. Yeah. Hey, did you Definitely. watch the John John Florence interview that Sam McIntosh did with him on Stab? Not only did I watch it, but it is my must-see moment presented by the performance-based petroleum-free trees wax. Well, I watched some of it, but I found myself I paused it and I just was consumed with his bookshelf. And so I did some investigating. <laughs> I did some investigating on his bookshelf. And um, some of the books, are you ready for some of the books that he has on his bookshelf? Uh, yeah, I would love to know. And Sam was uh, uh, interested in this as well. That's how they started the interview. Sam was like, like yeah, like, wow, you look smart. He is smart. I mean, totally. I don't think I don't think it's a stretch. You don't need to look at his bookshelf to know that he's. Okay, so there was a Bill Bryson book. I saw Bill. This took some investigating. Like it was of, hard of to read the titles. Did you get a magnifying glass out? I'm ashamed to say I did. <laughs> no, I didn't. I did not do that. But um, I just I squinted and I you know blew it up and. So there was a Bill Bryson book, which one I don't know, but you can't go wrong with Bill Bryson. He's a wonderful writer. A Sunburned Country. It's a great one. Yeah. There's another one too that I read. Walk in the Woods or whatever yeah. that one was. If you said it, I'd go, that's it. But I can't remember mm -hmm. the title. Um, I think it was something like a, 
it was kind of one of those broad focus, not lacking folk, but a broad based um, look at the world in general. But they printed like his name. Like everything his you name. need to know about everything or something about that. Okay. They you printed his name larger than. No, I don't. There's a Bill Bryson book and it's something like everything you need to know about the world or something like that. And he touches on everything and it's based on him bringing up his child, which might interest you and, you know, trying to get his kid interested in different aspects of, of I do. the world. So I just looked it up, a short history of nearly everything. Yes, that's it. Short I'm, history. I'm familiar with the book. I have not read that. It's a great book. It tells yeah. you about the stars and the planets and how cheese is made and you know, all sorts of stuff. It's really yeah, fun. That's great. Book. That's great. Um, then there was a book called Mastery by Robert Green that John John Florence has, has read. Don't know it. In this book, Robert Green demonstrates the ultimate form of power, which is mastery. And he does so by analyzing the lives of such past masters as Charles Darwin, Benjamin Franklin. Albert Einstein, Leonard, Leonardo da Vinci, as well as interviewing nine contemporary masters. So Mastery by Robert Greene, that was one of the books. And just look that one up too. What is that? Mastery, that's the book. Okay. I've got another one that'll interest you perhaps. Becoming a Supple Leopard. Look that one up. I don't know this one. Improve your athletic performance, extend your athletic career, treat stiffness and achy joints, and prevent and rehabilitate injuries all without having to seek out a coach, doctor, chiropractor, physical therapist, or massage therapist. In Becoming a Supple Leopard, Dr. Kelly Starrett shares her revolutionary, his revolutionary approach to mobility and maintenance of the human body and teaches you how to hack your own movement allowing you to live a healthier, more fulfilling life. The ultimate guide to resolving pain, preventing injury, and optimizing athletic performance. That makes sense, right, for, yeah. for John, who's, who's dealt with some stuff. Yep. There's another book called The Wave by Todd Strasser. Have you read this book or know about no. this book? No. Um, well, it's not what you think. It's about, it's a novelization of a, televised movie which is about the fictionalized account of a teaching experiment called the third wave and i'll just leave it at that i won't bore the listeners too much he there was also a bruce springsteen book um and do yourself a favor and try to uh take a deep dive into john john florence's bookshelf which i think was pretty much although the interview was great and sam does a great job i was more fascinated by the bookshelf so it's a long form interview. It's 32 minutes. They give you a condensed version in text under the video if you just want to read the article about it. But um, what I got out of this, what, well, what I got out of it was it was a lot about his process mm -hmm. for finals day, basically. And what was interesting about it was you'd hear it when I hear people talking about how they prepared for a particular event, you hear about all that preparation. What John John's preparation was, was stripping away all of the energy of the day. That's every answer to every question was just about blocking out the noise. And it was, you know, my, my brother, Nathan, and my best friend, Eli Olson came into town. And as soon as they came, they're cracking jokes. Like they don't care about all the pomp and circumstance. So they're cracking jokes. So that made me feel more comfortable, you know? Um, I do my guided meditation. It's all just about, because the reality is if you're the best surfer in the world, all you have to do is surf <laughs> and then let your surfing do the talking. And what are the things that prevent you from doing your best surfing? It's people showing up and gawking at you. It's people shouting your name. It's all of, you know, it's the, the WWE setup that they have where they're shouting out and in this corner and you're standing on a stage age. Like that is all a distraction from you just going out and surfing your best. So it proved to me that John John has the confidence and the self-awareness and to just see a spade as a spade. I am the best surfer in the world. I've proven it this year. There's nothing left to prove. All I got to go is do go surf four waves. That's it. And that's exactly what he did. 
And and Sam McIntosh even said at the beginning of the interview, he goes, we didn't think you could do it. <laughs> like to be perfectly honest, because Italo, on the other hand, is feeding off of all of that energy and you can see it hyping him up and it's pulsing through his veins. And so how could you not be distracted by that? How could you not let that get in your head? So Sam was implying like, Nobody, not you, but we didn't think anybody could just kind of calm and then go execute. And you did. You went out and surfed four waves, you know, basically. You didn't catch a lot of extra ones. Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, in many ways, the lack of swell or the sort of the fading swell or the lack of swell, if you will, worked against Idolo because Idolo was like this burning star. And it was like, how long will the star stay in the sky before it just burns and falls away into nothing? And of course, a lack of wave energy you know, Idolo is one of these guys that loves to stay busy and just keep going and just, and he's just, and everyone's like, well, what's he going to do next? And he's, you know, but when the waves kind of go flat or the swell's not producing, it's easier for that star to kind of burn out. And he certainly did that. And John rose to the occasion with that huge gaffing power hack that needs a name. <laughs> that way, that turn needs a name, the, the main peak carve or something like that. Yeah. I, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Something to do with gouge. John or... Hack? The John Hack? No, John, we could do John. better. No. Um, how about Hallow Thanksmas <laughs> when all three holidays are formed into one beginning October 1st in a corporate maneuver to eliminate money from your wallet via guilt and sentimentality? Mm. Hallow Thanksmas. I like it. It's it like the Travis Sham mockery. It is. It's very similar to that. You're pretty good at that. Um, so other things about this interview. First of all, the long form interview is supreme. I'm glad I've invested the last decade of my life into podcasting because this is exactly what we want, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I watched it and you would think it would be boring. You would think the reason they cut it down is because it's boring. No, the reality is him asking what your routine was the night before and having John kind of meander through the makings of his evening is more insightful than anything that they could condense down into one paragraph of text, which is generally how we've been processing interviews for the majority, you know, yeah. with the print magazines and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So hearing John, John meander through the question, kind of say things that are unimportant gives you a bunch of insight. Yeah, for I, sure. I love it. I do too. And it's, it's a great interview and um, that's well, what we're here for. That's why we pay the premium for the stab premium. Yeah. And um, also Sam asked him about finals day, the finals day format. He goes, you know, in that first heat, you only got one wave, I think up until a certain point in the heat, but it, for a long time in the heat, John had only gotten one wave. And so Sam goes, you know, how, how much were you thinking about Carissa Moore and what happened to Carissa Moore? Of course, the reminder is she won the whole, tour the whole season leading up to finals day she was in first place and then she lost on finals day and thereby lost the world title so how much were you thinking about that and john said i was thinking about it a lot he goes it was when you're sitting there having only caught one way caught one wave and you did all of the work all season long and you're thinking the reality sets in that oh i could lose the title simply because a second wave doesn't come that does not seem fair and so he didn't say i'm anti finals day he all but said it. And Sam laughed in a knowing agreement that, yeah, this whole thing is absurd. It seemed that they both felt like the, the concept was absurd. Yeah. Yeah, I think it can be tweaked on. We've talked about it. And Chris is a great example of she was so far out in front points wise that, you know, it seems like an injustice. Yeah, totally. Well, the other interesting thing was that he surfed uppers that morning. I know. He's anti-lowers. Too many people. <laughs> but just imagine you're just surfing uppers. John John cruises out, just casually catches a few waves. And you're like, dude, don't you have somewhere to be right there down the beach? Like, what are you doing here? Well, I mean, where else are you going to warm up? I mean, I'm I sure other competitors went up there and surfed, but. I know. I mean, I that... think he paddled out with Nathan too, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> How's that? I mean, that is the great thing about surfing. Yeah. You get to be side by side with your heroes. Totally. Yeah. It's really cool. When was the uh, first time? I'm trying to think. I know you had a moment when, you, you know, one of your heroes paddled out next to you and surfed. I think I remember Tom Carroll down at Blacks in the 80s. 
think that's the first time I was like, holy shit, this is one of the guys and he's here surfing with us. Um, do you have a, a moment like that? I don't know if it was the first, but I had Kelly Slater paddle out at Southside Huntington, like in the week leading up to the U S open one year, like in the late nineties. And, mm -hmm. um, my brother, I didn't even have my license yet. So my brother was supposed to come pick us up at the little cul-de-sac turnaround that is now, um, for Dukes, but it used to just be, you could just pick up and drop off there. Um, and it was like, we had gotten out of the water. My brother was going to pick us up and then Kelly Slater had just gotten changed and he was running down to go surf. I was like, Oh, looks like my brother's going to be waiting a little bit longer. <laughs> and we ran back down just so we could surf with Kelly. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, another moment from my childhood was, you know, I used to do these, um, longboard contests when I was a teenager, me and my buddy. And this was probably like 83 or 84 or something like that. And those contests, they back then they weren't broken up by age division. It was just an open division. So I'd be in heats with Dale Dobson, David Nueva, Skip Frum, you know, Les Potts, Albert Jenks. And, you know, for me, that was like, holy mackerel, you know, like let's talk about starstruck. Totally. Yeah. That'll get in your head. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to say something prosaic about this John John interview, like he's the hero we need. Like you watch him interview and there's a certain aura, you know what I mean? From the moment I started watching it permeated through the end. And I wanted to say something prosaic, like John John's the hero that surfing needs, you know, like he's just focused, he's centered, but the reality is he is not a hero. Like as I was watching, I'm thinking he is just a normal kid focused on surfing He's focused his life on surfing and he's particularly talented at it, talented at it. He is not a hero. He's just normal, you know, and that's what we love about him. He is the every man somehow hasn't been misguided by the amount of money that he has earned or distracted by the amount of vice that is available to him. So I think that is notable and honorable, um, but he is focused on the initial conceit of surfing Um and then he's also developed a bunch of other interests along the way, which make him very relatable. And he's carved out time for those things, whether it's sailing or reading or photography. And then also fatherhood, which is all relatable. It's like he's just living a normal life, you know, and happens to be the best surfer in the world. And to see him still grounded in that. And again, you get that from the very first moment on screen. He's just like, he doesn't have any pretense at all. It's really refreshing. It feels very much like this could and should be a jumping off point of some uh, on some level like kelly's gone john john's our champion everyone knows he's incredible he's and he's all these things that you just mentioned he's like doesn't even want to be limelight guy he's like that's cool i'm you know and it just seems like okay this is the jumping off point like if we had no more world champions from here to eternity it would be okay mm -hmm. surfing would survive now the industry would probably struggle a little bit and quite frankly uh florence marine x might struggle probably not but not yeah the, the industry demands that we have support you know like <clears throat> in, industries are driven by championships and so and it's a good thing i'm not saying it's a bad thing but it just feels like anything short of what we've just experienced in the Kelly Slater, everything built up to this moment, like from the beginning, from from the beginnings of surf competition. It just feels like this is it. It doesn't get any better. We've all realized that this is the epitome. Actually, a guy who just is leading the good life and surfing and like the best surfer we've ever seen. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, yeah. Is it anti where will it be anticlimactic next year if it's uh, Ethan you, Ewing? You, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's a great, great point. It, it really could. This is the pinnacle of it. We're living in it. Um, he lives a few houses down from where he grew up. You know, like he's gotten everything. He's still grounded, still doing the same thing. But the relatability is the other detail that I think distinguishes him from so many others that came before. And Kelly Slater, I think, has remained remarkably grounded. But he'd always felt like a superhero to me. Like he's just better looking. He's just more articulate. He's got you know, a celebrity kind of access to the whole celebrity world that he's in inner, he likes, you know, he's involved in that stuff. So Kelly never felt relatable to me, 
John, on the other hand, is just, he's just a regular dude. So, um, and the other, other champs in recent years, the Gabriel Medinas or Italos or Felipe's or whatever, you could see how much their life has changed by their celebrity status and the money and all that sort of stuff. It's changed them, you know? Yeah. And so this is so, it, it was just really, really refreshing to see this from John. So yeah, I like it. And I like what you stated too. And Treeswax must see moment treeswax.com treeswax will be at the boardroom show yeah go check that out a great interview by sam mcintosh um dave rostovich electric acid surfboard test they had the premiere here in encinitas at the la paloma i did not go um i try to avoid those types of things like the plague not that they're not fun i think i've aged out i think if i was 20 i'd be all about it um but i'm excited about the electric acid surfboard test they have announce the shapers and david everything makes sense until one shaper comes up <laughs> do you know what i'm talking about i do know who you are talking about please explain this to me and am i too up in arms about this not that i'm up in arms but i'm kind of wondering like is this guy a shaper he's not a shaper and I why does love... it say he's a shaper then why does it say he's a shaper it is it a disservice to the hundreds of guys that are grinding, trying to build surfboards and that can actually turn a planer on? Not that this guy can't. By the way, I don't want to throw shade on this guy. I'm just trying to understand it. Aren't you going to feel silly if this guy wins? I hope he does win. I mean, I know he's a board designer. No, he's shaped boards before. Was that? I mean, I've shaped a board. Does that make me a shaver? No. Well, they're not saying he's a shaper by profession. They're putting shaper there, meaning he. He shaped he, this board. Okay. That's what Fair I presumed. Enough. But I think that your point is salient in that we're holding this event and we're really, we want to have, um, you know, you should earn your way into it. Basically, we want to have notable shapers. You should earn your way in. And so this guy getting access into the event is a little bit leapfrogging a bunch of other deserving shapers, you could argue. That's but kind I, of, yeah. But I not still really. love it. I, I still too. love it. Yeah. I hope he wins it. I just, so I sent a thing out to our friend, uh, I said, is Dane Reynolds a shaper for CI question mark? And our friend sent back a thing. He said, he's definitely a designer and he shapes here and there, but technically, no, he's not a shaper for CI, but that it is, it is pretty fun. Like, will we be able to look at the boards and go, that one's definitely Dane's board because it's, it's kind of crude. So Dane Reynolds, of course, is who we are talking about a professional surfer, Come shaper though. I mean, like he's work. He's like you said, been in the uh, shaping bay plenty with Britt Merrick and whoever else. Um, and even Al. I mean, I know yeah. he's done tons of work with Al, and he he's obviously totally into surfboards because David, as you know, here's a guy that would pull a board out of a dumpster and go, you know what, this board looks insane. I like this board. Let's make something like this. And he has spent time shaping a few boards. Who knows how many are under his belt? Yeah, but. I like the idea that Stab is throwing a curveball like this. And this is almost the idea of the electric acid surfboard test. Yes. Uh, is to allow for the magic to happen. Um, yes. So I, I, I'm i into this concept. We will get into the shapers, but I want to state first that they po they with this preview or with this screening that they did in Encinitas, which by the way, the film goes live tomorrow on mm -hmm. uh, Stab Thursday, Premium. Thursday, October 3rd. So Thursday, October 3rd, episode one, um, along with this screening that they did, they put an article on STAB and it was a preview of what to expect from the electric acid surfboard test. And what I liked about this preview is that it directly addresses so many things that we've criticized them about in the past, where the series gets revealed or airs, and then we go, man, I didn't know what the parameters were going into this, or they changed the parameters at some point. I feel like this preview was meant to mitigate any of those questions that might come up later because they explained what the premise was for the shapers. They explained the original shoot location was supposed to be in Morocco, you know, but then they couldn't do it in Morocco. So it ended up being in Australia. They explained that the length or the limit of time that the shapers had, we gave them the missive on June 8th, and then we needed the boards by February 10th. These elements changed in that one month time. So they had these kind of 
uh, restrictions or limit. The shapers had these restrictions or limitations. Donald Brink only had one week to shape his because we offered it to him at the very end. So I liked knowing all of that before I watched the series so that I can kind of moderate my expectations, you know, temper. Yeah, the shapers were going into it going, okay, I'm building a board for Moroccan point waves, right? Yeah. And it sounds like they've built boards for Australian point waves, which is pretty damn similar, you know, pretty damn similar. So, and, and New South Wales apparently got, well, did get a lot of really great waves during the filming of, so um, it's going to be, it's going to be good, Dave, on a bunch of different boards and really fast, right points, getting barreled and doing huge hacks and, and, and displaying those moments between the turns that, that creates and differentiates a, a great surfer from just you and me. Well, the list of shapers are one Ryan Lovelace, Neil Purchase Jr., Corey Graham, Avalon Sterick, Donald Brink, Dane Reynolds, Ian Byrne, Duke Ipa, Fletcher Chenard, Mark Andrini, and John Simon. What a lineup. Avalon Sterick. That's a name that I don't know much about. So I'll tell you the little bit that I do know. Um, Matt Parker at Album Surfboards did a collaboration brand with Coco Ho that they released about a year ago. And those boards are being made in Australia and California for their respective markets. In Australia, Avalon Sterick is shaping those boards. Yeah, I'm just looking at her thing on on uh, Instagram here and so, uh, checking out what she's doing. Yeah. I remember talking to Matt about this uh, a year ago when he was explaining the Coco Ho, the Exo Coco concept. And he said, really, I'm kind of the designer behind this in collaboration with Coco, but I want it to be, I don't want it to be necessarily all my shapes, you know, like I'm helping design it based on our proven, you know, uh, models, Mm -hmm. but I want to make modifications of course, for the female surfer. And then I think that the female surfer should be the ones building the boards. And so he's got a team of females uh, here in Southern California that are both shaping and laminating the boards. And then in Australia, Avalon Steric is part of that process as well. I'm not sure if she's laminating or not, but she is shaping the XO Cocoa boards there. So it's a really, uh, it's a cool concept, and I think it's savvy of Stab, or it's cool of Stab to include Avalon in this instead of Matt Parker, let's say, who's done it before. Yeah, on her Instagram, it looks like she does laminate as okay, well. Cool. So maybe she's doing that. And pretty cool, pretty cool, pretty fun. It's a fun list. They've got a great list from Dane to Avalon, who are kind of, um, you know wild cards i guess is that is that a that's not a stretch and then Under, the underdogs for sure and then some mainstays like andrini but and... andrini is not i think he did one of these before for dane reynolds but i don't think andrini i think that's the only time i've seen his name well when i see mainstay i mean uh i don't mean mainstay in in the electric acid thing i just mean uh, you know a solid legendary iconic shaper so the style, I'm really curious how those boards um, perform. That's, like That's going to be an edge board, do you think? I don't know. Or is it going to be a whole design? Like, I, I'm really curious to see what he makes for, uh, for Dave. And of course, Dave is comfortable on any of it. So I'm just, I'm really interested to see that. I board. am too, because I know Mark well enough to know that he's kind of like, look, these are the boards that I build good yeah. luck you know what I yeah, mean? exactly like, he's not going to tweak anything just so it, he can like try to win he's going to be like i know for a fact that these boards go great totally you know but i could also see him doing an edge board because he did edge boards he flew over there and hung out with greeno and um and dave was a part of that process that was quite a while ago but so you know he's refined the edge board i wouldn't be surprised to see an edge board so for everything we just explained about andrini I have equal interest in every one of those other shapers in a different way. Each yeah. name, I'm like, oh, interesting. Okay, well, what are they doing? I know. Like Ian Byrne, do you, are you thinking like a deep six channel thing, which is kind of where you go when you see that last name? Um, Neil Purchase Ronald Jr. Brink. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say Neil Purchase Jr. with a duo. Oh, yeah. I mean, that 
I mean, we haven't seen the boards yet. Have you seen the boards? I've seen the outlines. Okay. So there could be a duo there. Brian which, Lovelace, which you would... don't know what he's going to, he can do all sorts of different stuff. Yeah. Um, Corey Graham feels like a twin fin. Probably a lot of twin fins. Donald Brink could be an ASIM. Who knows? Donald's got wild idea. There could be some wild stuff, you know? And let's not forget, Donald won this previous iteration with the mixtape with uh, partnering with Matt Biolas for Mick Fanning. Exactly. So Duke, Duke Ipa, of course, coming son of Ben Ipa, Fletcher Chenard, the son of Yvonne Chenard. So there could be a for... sting. There could be a sting, right? Fletcher's Fletcher's known for um, real kind of stiletto kind of Ventura point waves, you know, like gun, you know, narrow ripping fast boards. Um, John and Simon. John... You know, you're, you've yeah. got a Simon. You've got an ASIM. I've got a John Simon, Brian Birch is written John Simons, like John's made some big uh, waves in a short amount of time that he's been shaping. So I'm great, glad to see his name thrown in the mix too. So I'm excited, super excited tomorrow night and um, their episodes are going to be airing every two weeks. So October 3rd, October 17th, October 31st, Halloween, and then November 14th. You know, as I look at this list too, Ryan Lovelace, he won the Jerry Lopez shape off when we honored Jerry at the boardroom show. That's right. Uh, Donald Brink has won best in show. And he competed in the Terry Martin shape off and probably another one. Um, of course, we honored Ben Ipa. Mark Andrini was an icon of foam. We honored Mark Andrini. And Mark also won the... Uh, I think he won the chunk of foam challenge or maybe well, i know he won the shape off that we did for john bradbury and john simon won best in show too one year as a young hmm. shaper who just put his board you know so there's a lot of connections to the boardroom show in this list i would presume mark will, mark andrini will be at the boardroom show he's usually oh, yeah there. yeah 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 mark's got a big booth cool so come see that um very cool well very excited um, surfer magazine is doing their surfer of the year for the big wave challenge. You know, we've talked about this big wave challenge awards show that they're doing, um, kind of revitalized it and it's an online version, but three contenders on the men's side of the draw. It is Nathan Florence, Lucas Chumbo, Chianca and Jojo Roper are the three male surfers in the big wave challenge for surfer of the year. Do you have a favorite which one has performed the best over 2024? Well, I'd have to look at all of the the entries from the three surfers, you know. Mm -hmm. But obviously my favorite is Jojo Roper. Jojo Roper is an absolute charger of the, you know, like they all are, of course. Oh, look, all three of them are insane. Jojo is my favorite. And Jojo just got invited to the Eddy as well. So congrats to Jojo for that. I want to see Jojo Roper win this. Um, that's just my personal sort of sentimentality around it without like really doing a deep dive into each and every ride. It's a, he's a working class hero. He is. He's that's a, what he's so likable for that reason. And each yeah. Works hard, saves works. money. Yeah. And, and then when there's a swell, either he's drives hot. up, drives up to Mavericks or flies out to Tavarua. Well, he does it all. He'll do it all in one weekend. <laughs> and he's there with everybody. He's there with a who's who of, stickered up pros you know so it's so cool to see and then it's cool to see him get the wave of the day in those scenarios too yeah i'm stoked so <clears throat> but when you watch the footage the video uh clips that surfer put together nathan florence is undeniable and it's strictly a matter of the amount of resource he could throw at this endeavor you know um Lucas Chumbo's waves look like they're all at Nazare. It's like, okay, he spent a bunch of time at Nazare and Jojo hit a couple of good swells throughout the year and he performed, but Nathan's all over the place all the time. So it's like, he's going left, he's going right. He's on a slab. He's on a big mountain of water. He's, a, he's getting barreled. He's doing a big carve. It's like, how do you beat Nathan at this point? He the just Nathan, can outspend. It's a really great point that his resources make it an unfair advantage. How it, You can't outspend Nathan. No, no, because he's actually not even paying for it. 
Like, you know what I mean, like, well, he's Florence he, Marine X is now like, it's all part not, of the marketing dollars. No, that's not even true. Oh, sorry. You don't think that's true? Can you hear me still? Yeah, I can hear you. What about right, now? Sorry. I pulled out my mic or my uh, headphones. You, you think Nathan Florence is paying for this out of his own pocket? Nathan I'm not is saying last year he didn't, but I mean, he's on Florence Marine X now. Like, this is part of their marketing budget. I don't think so. I think they pay him a salary and he can use that salary however he wants. I don't think those contracts, you know, cover your airline tickets anymore. Um, I'm, I don't know. I've not seen it, but I'm just saying he's designed a business model yeah. that requires him to create a bunch of content that that's the reason why he's getting paid. So he's designed all of that. Um, whether or not he's writing it out of his account or somebody else's, I'm not exactly sure, but the reality is he can outspend anybody. The that's yeah i mean that's a great point okay. yeah at what point do we create categories <laughs> you don't need to i mean it send is send us what it your is. w2 so we know where you're at i i mean the reality is look jojo can leverage this amount of or this accolade even if he doesn't win it the fact that he's nominated in in the top three means he can leverage that, that accolade to try try to uh do something similar to try to build a brand, to try to get a new sponsor that turns into a new trip, then you get more accolades. You know what I mean? Like that yeah. is the model. Yeah. Um, I just also wanted to follow up on the quick silver fest. We talked about last week that came to completion. They got a little bit of swell. It wasn't good, but, um, Joe Frenchman won the quick fest in, uh, Hossiger. So Joan Deru, Mark Lacomer in first over Jeremy Flores and Kelly Slater, Clay Marzo and Bobby Martinez down to third from their first place position. So congrats to those. Yeah. Good stuff. By the way, um, when I was checking out the surfer thing, I went to their website, surfermag.com. Yeah. I think it's, uh, polished. It looks good. It's all redesigned. There's not a bunch of these clickbaity type of Google ads popping up in my face anymore. And uh, it looks great. I agree. I'm actually on the site right now looking at the seven best places to surf, to surf and stay in Fiji, which just popped right up as if they're listening to me. Um, Funny course, how that water, works. Waterways travel is uh, the go-to for that. But um. So the site looks great, but I don't know if you remember, we talked about the print publication about a month and a half ago, two months ago. Yeah. Uh, I've had some inside conversations, behind the scenes conversations about kind of, I was supposed to receive that magazine. I never received it. I'm like, okay, well, where can I go buy it? Oh, can't find it anywhere. So whatever efforts they were making that we discussed a month and a half ago, two months ago, seem to have been undercut or adjusted in the last month and a half. And maybe that print magazine is not going to come to fruition. Maybe, or if it is out there somewhere on a, maybe on a rack at a surf shop, seeing another issue printed is probably unlikely at this point. We're not going to see a rising of the Phoenix like we were anticipating. Okay. Disappointed to say. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now you're waiting for the great return. Actually, you know what I'm waiting for is I I bought, I pre-ordered Todd Glazer's uh, book with Kelly Slater. Um, it's like a coffee table book that I'm sort of excited to get. Art directed by Chris Malloy. Oh, really? Oh, cool. How cool Maybe. is that? That's very cool. So um, I'm looking forward to getting that. But, it looks great. I mean, I saw them advertising that and kind of looked through all the previews of it. It looks amazing. Yeah. yeah Those guys cool. have been working together for so long. Yeah. It should be a pretty, pretty cool coffee table book, you know? I saw Glazer interviewed and um, he was talking about his style of photography as he's been working with Kelly over the years Yeah, is, you know, you can be, anybody can be in the right place at the right time and shoot a photo, let's say. But to do it consistently, you have to foster trust with the subject. So if Kelly shows up at Pipeline, of course, there's a bunch of people on the beach they can get a photograph. But Kelly's going to the Cook Islands tomorrow and he doesn't trust all those photographers. He needs somebody who knows not only when to take a photo, but when not to take a photo. Yeah. And so once you're you know, develop. And so that's what Todd has fostered think, that level of trust and comfort yeah. with Kelly to be in the inner, you know, sanctum of Slater's world. 
and not to exploit any of that, but simply, to, and it is okay to document certain intimate things and potentially publish them later, but not exploiting it is the key. And so Todd's delicately, I think Todd understood that innately and um, that's why he's in the position that he's in, but Todd's because of it, Todd has amassed an incredible collection, of course, of imagery with Kelly. And so that's, I think, what the book is drawing from. Yeah, I would agree that the key thing there is knowing when not to take a photo. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, if you violate that, I don't know if it's a policy or it's just an ethos or, but if there's a violation, it only takes one violation for you to be out. You don't you know get three I mean? strikes? I don't know, but I'm, you know, I think that you get, you got to be, you have to use discretion. I want to know, I want to see the the photos that got people banned. Not just from <laughs> Kelly, but from anybody in a big scenario. That would be, like, that would be cool. Yeah. That'd be cool. Like, like, uh, who's the, like Annie Leibovitz, like the photos that got her banned from the stones or something like exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, those would be the good photos. Um, yeah. In kind of a closing note, one other thing that I saw on Surfer Magazine's website, I said it was surfermag.com. I guess it's just surfer.com now that I'm surfer. looking at it. Com, yeah. um, coastal er North, North Shore Coastal Erosion, they did this article. I think it was Jake Howard did an article about the homeowners um, are being fined for trying to protect their homes from the coastal erosion, putting sandbags, pouring concrete, stuff like that out on the beach. And it turns out um, those things are only accelerating the erosion. So that's why they're being fined. But I just think the North Shore is going to look like a different... I think, interestingly, Jeff Johnson posted something similar on Instagram a couple of weeks ago, because I think he was on the North Shore. And he said, this place looks totally different than it did 10 years ago. I think he said, I have no idea what the solution is. I can't pinpoint a cause necessarily. However, what I can say for sure is that the North Shore looks totally coastal along the beach, looks totally different than it did 10 years ago. And that is a fact. And so I think it's worth noting and bringing up to everybody's attention uh, because it'll look different in 10 years again. And who knows what this will do? I mean, look, if you're lucky enough to own real estate there, you know, unfortunately, maybe that's going to be at risk. But What's it going to do to the waves? What's it going to do to the hallowed surfing grounds and all of that stuff that comes with it? So it's worth keeping an eye on. Yeah. It's look, it's an erosional coastline. You know, there's depositional coastlines and there's erosional coastlines. And I think when you're facing 30 foot winter waves each and every year for thousands of years, it's going to do a road. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just a matter of time. It's a matter of time, whether or not it happens in our time, I don't know, but could yeah. affect all of the surfing that we, all the famous surf spots we know and love. Surfers are the worst, man. <laughs> okay. Nothing has ever been more true. Yeah. It remains to be true every time you say it. It is. Um, but there's some really great surfers and some really great people uh, that, that happen to ride waves. I think that's a better way to phrase it really great people that happen to ride waves like John, John Florence, like David Lee scales, Thanks, like Sam McIntosh. There's a lot of good people and there's a, a few ugly ones. And there's some good people that occasionally um, have ugly moments, which I am, I fall into that category. And so everybody, uh, everybody yes. can relate to that. So when I say surfers, the worst kind of tongue in cheek, you know, but Oh, some, we get it. Some we get it. You it don't too. have to explain. Okay. Um, but I did, now that you mentioned Sam McIntosh, I had written as my Duke this week, stab magazine, two home runs, the electric acid surfboard test, getting Dave Rostovich involved, I'm sure was a great effort and it's really, really exciting. And then the John, John Florence interview, John, John does not give very many interviews. And, uh, I think Sam did a fantastic job with the opportunity. So Duke, I think. I'm already thinking who should be the next one, who should be the next surfer for the electric acid surfboard test. You know who it should be? No. Joel Tudor. Great call, <laughs> dude. You're going to get some great commentary from Joel Tudor. Wow. Yeah. Great call. 
They got to get Joel. It would be epic. What about Joel and Tosh combo? Tosh is almost too nice. Tosh is too young. I feel like Tosh, I, Tosh is one of my favorite free surfers right now, if not my favorite free. But I think Joel, Joel's the guy we want because of the the barbs that are going to fly. Like the commentary that's going to occur is just going to be all time. Pure entertainment, dude. Yeah. And, and, and insightful. I mean, you want to talk about board design? He can do yeah, it. For sure. And history. Yeah, for sure. So, so wow, Joel, great call. Joel's got to be the next guy. My final note before we sign off is that is a glorious cashmere sweater you got on there. Thank you. My wife has purchased, I like cashmere. I want to grow old gracefully and with some sense of, I just, you know, I'm embracing it. I'm embracing the old man thing. It doesn't have to be an old man thing. I mean, look, if it was a cardigan, that would be one thing, but that's a crew neck. It's a cool color. It's kind of a cream, maybe a bone, I would say. Yeah, uh, like champagne. Champagne. Yeah. Okay. I got it. But yeah. I love it. And uh, it is one of the great materials. I mean, oh man, lightweight, so it's cool. Like if it's a warm summer night, you could still wear that out, look stylish, not be overly hot. But it's also really warm if you need it. If it was a little bit colder, you can still wear it in the cold weather. It's really a great material. Yeah, I might have to wear it to the Padre game tonight. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, settle down. Okay. Look, David, we've said a lot. We've had a great um, discourse. By the way, you can catch Randy Rarick on the Boardroom Podcast or Jordan Brazy. And David, who are some of the recent Surf Splendor guests that you've interviewed? You've had some all-times good ones lately. Dude, Dick Metz, two weeks in a row. The dude is 95. He is still going unbelievably strong. People By are the way, ripping. I got so I have these moments, right? Where like, you know, sometimes you get calls from people. Like you probably get like calls from Chris Malloy, and you're like, how cool is this that Chris Malloy's calling? Like, I got a call from Rennie Yader the other day. And I'm like looking at my phone, I'm like, how cool is it that Rennie Yader's calling me? You know, and I picked it up. Rennie, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And you know, Rennie, he's all time. He's just like, Scott what time's the show? Like he's just so all business, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then I got a call from Dick. I got a call from Dick Metz. And I was like, how cool is this? Like I actually take screenshots and I say, I'm like, that is so cool. that Dick Metz called me and that Rennie Yader called me. And it's a lot of fun. So I, anyway, it's good for funny you. That Dick you do, Metz, yeah, go ahead. It's funny that you do the screenshot thing. Cause I've done that too, where I'll get to my phone, whatever is missing for an hour and I'll go grab it. And it's like missed call from some surf, personality yeah uh instagram notification of another surf personality commenting on my thing a text message from a third to surf personality and it's like four or five or six all in a row like at a particular moment yeah. not that this is every day it just happened to pile up on one given day and i'm looking at it i'm like that is a screenshot right there <laughs> young david scales would definitely be impressed by that yeah that's a fan i have fanboy moments you know and it's when when rennie or dick calls it's like oh that's so cool I know it is really cool. Um, and then the other one that people should listen to, I'm going to publish tomorrow probably, is Eric Crane. He is the CEO of Birdwell, yeah. Birdwell's Beach Bridges. Um, fascinating dude. Uh, really, really smart. You know, you sit there and you listen to somebody talk for a while and you just go, I need to up my game. <laughs> I thought I was pretty savvy. I thought I was pretty tuned in. This guy is so sharp. Um, but grew up in essentially grew up in San Clemente and uh, worked for Arnett. And then mm -hmm. Arnett got purchased by Bausch and Loam. So he was able to kind of understand how acquisitions work. Went and got a bunch of other industry experience when Arnett went away or, you know, got sold again. Uh, he and a group started electric sunglasses. And so he built up electric sunglasses. Ultimately, um, that was purchased by Volcom, which was then purchased by a caring group. He then bought it back from caring group himself. So he's the man kind of behind electric. He wasn't the original founder, but he's part of the original group. And then, uh, is now and does done a ton of other work in the industry. And then is now yeah. CEO of Birdwell. So fascinating dude. And the Birdwell story is amazing. Yeah. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> I followed Eric's career and I'm a big fan of Birdwell, of course. And, yeah. um, and I'm stoked for those guys. And, you know, speaking of guys like um, Eric Crane, I finished Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. And if you're interested in 
a guy's career trajectory and all of the family issues and things that he had to go through relationships, everything. It's a wonderful book. Um, cool. Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. I know it's been out for a while, but uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's worth a, a read. Awesome. By the hey. way, I'm just about finished with Lonesome Dove for those of you that are interested. And our book club just started a new book and I'm going to pull it up for you. I'm really looking forward to it. And it's about the IRA. And let's see here. Bear with me here. Thank you, listeners. I'm scrolling. I'm Okay, I found it. It is called Armed Struggle, the History of the IRA by Richard English. And one of my Irish friends in my book club suggested it. So it's going to be, a, I'm always into the IRA stories. There's some good ones. Yeah. No, it's crazy. Yeah. And you know awesome. what? I don't think John John Florence has that book on his bookshelf. So there. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening, John. Insecurities rising. All right, David, we've said a lot. Until next time, adios and aloha. All right, Scott. Realwatersports.com, of course. The one-stop retail shop for all of your surfboard needs. 70% off right now. There's a 70% off sale at Real Water Sports. You can go log on. They've got an entire collection of stuff. Surfboards, foils, soft goods, hard goods, wetsuits. Things are on sale, folks. So go check out Real Water Sports right now for a big sale. I'm just, I pulled up the sale just real quickly. They've got Machado Firewire Sunday model for 43% off comes down to under 500 bucks. Um, JS's Christensen's fins, traction leashes, all of it. Yeah. So go and get in on that fall sale at real watersports.com. All right. Thanks. Okay. Talk to you later. <laughs>